It is awesome to, there's something about not just worship, but anointed worship. I'm going to say that again. There's something about anointed worship. Regular worship is great. I mean, you can play a song right now off of, you know, Spotify, iTunes, whatever, and it'll be good. But there's something about when there's an anointing. Uh, in fact, the songs are all meant to be anointed, but there's a lot of songs in today's culture um, yeesh, that uh, <laughs> they're more me-centric. They're about where we are. Oh, I'm weak and poor or lowly or like my feels. I'm all in my feels, right? Because that's the culture is get in your feelings. Well, how does that make you feel? You know, uh, it's just, and, and I, I get it, I get it, you know. You, you got to identify, you got to locate where you are. But the thing is, is you don't stay there. You don't build your foundation at where your feelings are right now. In fact, uh, Darnell and I were having a conversation this week, and I said, man, let me tell you something about, he kept getting this in the spirit about feelings. I go, yeah, you're on, you're on to something for sure. And I said, let me tell you something about feelings, Darnell. Uh, I said, feelings will do one of two things. They'll imprison you. Or they'll empower you. But you cannot uh, uh, regulate your life based on how you feel. Because a lot of times what people do nowadays is they think it's the Holy Spirit. Or they think it's the Lord based on how it feels. Well, I just don't feel like that's the Lord. No, that's a, called uncomfortable. Your flesh doesn't like it. But the Lord's prompting you to let that go or to step out or to get free from that so you can come up so your flesh is no longer ruling you i'm telling you guys i mean god's just been um <clears throat> wrecking me in such a good way lately that um i implore each and every one of you make time i dare you i double dog dare you to spend time with the Lord, to set aside, even if it's just 10 minutes, and say, Lord, I'm just going to sit. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive from you uh, this, this morning, Lord. I'm going to receive. I'm going to get whatever you have for me in your word. And if you've never really done this, it's okay to plop and drop, okay? But don't, don't rely on plopping and dropping. You know what plop and drop is? Like, oh, uh, let's see. Oh, the Lord says uh, Judah hung himself. Hmm. Let me plop again. I didn't like that one. Oh, be, do like the disciples. Oh, what? No, I really don't like that. No, that see, that, that doesn't get you in there. But, you know, let me help you out. Let me help you out. Start in John. John is the, the self-proclaimed disciple that Jesus loved. But it is a love book. And start like in John 13, then 14, then in 15. And just abide, start finding out about what it looks like, what it means like in when you start getting into the Word, then the Word starts getting into you, and the Holy Spirit starts talking to you through the Word. Something will come up, and instead of your knee-jerk reaction of getting ticked off or wanting to handle it by your flesh, the Word will come up in you and tell you how to address the situation, and then you're no longer repeating the same old cycles. And so... You know, the past couple of weeks, God's really been, you know, showing us some things about knowing Him and coming to know Him um, and, you know, letting go of some things. And this week, man, I, I'm just so thankful. Wasn't last week awesome with the baptisms? I mean, it was amazing. It was so wonderful. I loved it. Uh, it was so good. I mean, there's just something so special about that. Um, and I was thankful for it, but I was so even more excited about today. And it's not that the baptisms weren't as, you know, meaningful as this, but there's something that's been burning in my heart that I can't wait to share with you. Like, I am hungry for more of God. Is anybody else hungry for more of God? Is anybody else thirsty for more of Him? I think there's like a mosquito spray in here or something because it's really affecting my eyes. Uh, it's making them get really watery. 
But I believe that everybody in here is uh, uh, very hungry or you wouldn't be here on a Sunday morning. And there's plenty of churches that you could be at, but I believe that God has designed and led you and directed you here today. Because it, it's not just to come to any church, but to come to the right church, the right place that's going to give you exactly what you need to walk in your God-given destiny. And I believe that's what the, the, the um, calling or the vision of Encounter Church is is that we would fulfill, not only discover, but fulfill the God-given design and destiny that he's placed on each and every one of our lives. Amen. So, you know, we're all hungry, but how do we fulfill and how do we fill that hunger? Well, you know, a a knee-jerk reaction was like, get in the Word. Get in prayer. Right? And those are 100% true. They are literally true the foundation of how you can get filled and how you can satisfy that hunger. But there's something else to it that a lot of times we um, negate or we let go of or, or we uh, what we do is we find these certain truths uh, in the Word and then we negate the others. For example, we love to pray in the Spirit here. Because, I mean, it is amazing. It's like, have y'all seen that movie, Wind Talkers? Do you remember that movie? Some of y'all are like, dang, you're old. I don't know what you're talking about. Was it Nicolas Cage and that, what's the Native American, what's his name? Anyhow, it's a movie from World War II. It wasn't made in World War II, but it was made like in the 90s. Was it the 90s? Did you guys, who's seen it? Show of hands. Okay, was it the 90s or 2000s? Something like that. Some of y'all weren't even born then, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, but the movie Wind Talkers is a, I like walking around. Can I come down here for a second? Okay, okay, cool, cool. Sorry, online people. You'll probably get the top of my head. Um, the thing about Wind Talkers was so cool because it was an actual account of how we won a, a portion of the war, of World War II. And, and what had happened is that the, the Japanese uh, and the enemy of, the alliance of the the world war um they were breaking every code we could come up with they were breaking you know some boy scout code they were breaking some cryptic pig latin code they were breaking everything man they were just tearing it up and they were like getting super frustrated and so you know when we recruited or we drafted Actually, there was more people that rec- that signed up than got drafted, but we drafted, and they, they drafted, you know, everybody. Didn't matter your nationality, Native American, African American, American American, Irish American. Didn't matter. You're drafted in. Well, there was this group of Navajo Indians, and they're talking, and these people, you know, in the bases are, like, making fun of them and just really riding them hard, man. It was unfair, unjust. It's really uncool. Um, But they started to talk, and this one sergeant or whatever had this great idea. Hey, this should be our communication. And so they started to talk in their native tongue, and as they did, they were advancing the troops, and they were winning these battles. And the more battles they won, the more momentum they got. And no matter how hard they tried, the enemy could not crack the code of the wind talkers. And that's how it is when we pray in the Holy Spirit. It is literally an uncrackable code to the enemy. I just feel the anointing on that, man. I'm telling you, if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, we can fix that today. There's so much power. God is longing. He's longing for you to have that gift. It's not that it's a gift that you might get. It's for everyone. Paul says that I pray that you all would speak in tongues. It's available to everyone. This has nothing to do with my nose, but this has everything to do with what God desires for you. Amen? And so a lot of times what we do is we'll relegate one truth and negate the others. 
Like, let's pray in the Spirit. Let's have a Holy Ghost time. But to heck with balancing my checkbook and being accountable. <laughs> to heck with being a person of character uh, and being on time. Don't shut me down because I'm preaching good. Uh, to heck with being a person of your word and actually doing what you say you're going to do to a fault. And, and I'm, not point, I'm not getting on anybody. And, and let me just tell you, this is what God's been telling me. So I'm preaching to myself. You just guys, you get to be in the room. <laughs> but I believe that he's saying it not just to me, but to all of us. So there's, there's this one thing that um, I think that a lot of times, especially in this culture, we're missing. You know, prayer is vital. That's our lifeline with God. The Word is is vital because you can't pray without the word. If you're just praying stuff, you know, and it's not according to the word, you're not going to see any results. But there's something that we need. We need the full word of God, and there's something that the Lord is calling to us and calling of us, longing for us to step into, and it's a level of holiness that can only be accessible through deep thirst. Now, I asked the worship team this morning, you know, and I said, hey, what, what, is, what does holy mean to you? And these guys are assassins. They're good. They, they, know, they know the word, and they've been actually paying attention whenever I preach or something like that. And so they gave me all the right answers, and I was upset about it. I was like, gosh, you guys actually listen? Dang. But, <laughs> and they said, you know, these, the, the right, correct answers, but... If I were to take this microphone in an in a, in a iPhone or something and go out to, you know, downtown Tulsa or downtown Broken Arrow or wherever and go up to somebody and start taking a census, hey, guys, what does holy mean to you? Um, godly? Like Catholic? You know, like, I don't know. Uh, um, Mother Teresa? And really what they're saying is it's something that is not relatable or obtainable in my life. That's how a lot of times we view holy. Like, hey, that's good. I'd like to be there, but you know what? There's just too much stuff going on in my life, and, you know, I'll get to that when I get everything else straightened out. It's like saying I'm going to join the gym when I start getting in better shape. Makes no sense. Um, and so, holy truly is something that we don't necessarily understand. It's kind of a knee-jerk thing, like, oh, yes, well, I, we should be holy. He's holy, holy. You know, he's holy. We know that. He's the purest of pure. He's the greatest of great. He is uh, untainted. There's nothing wrong in him. There's not even a shadow or darkness of turning in him. He's the purest, holiest thing out there, right? But, it, you know, when people look at holy and they look at this, you know, Mother Teresa, you know, when I was in, in Nepal, there was a lot of um, Buddhist monks and, and some uh, Chinese monks and stuff like that because uh, it was right in between India and Nepal, I mean, India and China. And there was this one monkey temple that we went to. It was monkeys everywhere. It's crazy. Uh, it was really weird. Um, but there was these monks, and everywhere you go, there's this little spool, and they would spin it and say a prayer. It's almost like a Catholic rosary, but it was like life size. <laughs> uh, but then there was a time of the year that these priests and people that wanted to be holy would literally roll on the ground for miles miles because they thought that their works their 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 duties or their their you know discipline is what made them holy and a lot of times we think that well if i go to church enough i'll be kind of holy you know and it's really cool in this culture like i even posted it on facebook a while back or whatever it was instagram i'm half hood half holy right you can pray with me, but don't play with me, right? 
But really, if we get serious about it, we really should be all holy. And let me explain to you what holy is. Do you want to know what it means? A lot of the worship team already knows, so they, they just could have spoiled it, but they didn't. Holy is actually, uh, obviously, a Hebrew word. You know, the Bible wasn't written in English. It wasn't even written in Greek. It was actually Aramaic, and they translated it from a Hebrew language into uh, uh, Greek, and from Greek, actually, Latin, uh, in Latin, English. You know, the New King James or the King James Version was the first English version of how they could take this context of this word. And the Hebrew word for holy is kadosh. And there's this old song, I guess, it's old. It goes, kadosh. Like literally like that. It's, and he goes, Elohim, Elonai. I mean, it's like Kadosh. And really, he's just saying holy over and over and over. Kadosh. But here's what Kadosh means, and it actually ties in to what we heard about baptism last week. Does anybody remember what the word baptism meant in Hebrew? It starts with the M, ends with the A. Ah. Mikvah? Okay, good, good. Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> um, so kadosh and mikvah are very similar because literally the mikvah was something to separate or to consecrate from unholy to holy and kadosh is the word holy and kadosh means this set apart for a unique or specific purpose let me say that again God's definition of holy is set apart for a unique and specific purpose and I was sharing with the, the men yesterday you know in, in Isaiah 6 and I believe in Revelations 4 it says the angels cry out to God holy 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 is the Lord of hosts day and night they're doing that right so listen to what this truly means this is what the angels are saying you are so holy, so set apart from anything and everything in every situation. God is set apart from anything and everything in every situation. Whatever situation you have, he's already got something set apart for you. There is no one that loves the way you do, Lord. Kadosh. No one has the perspective that you do. No one in all the earth is as kind and merciful as you. Kadosh, your justice is like no other justice in the universe. You are uniquely different from anything else you have created. That's deep. See, holiness isn't about being absolutely perfect, but instead about being separated from what is sinful. Now, we automatically throw sin into a weird category, too. Like sin, the obvious sin, the blatant sin is, oh, stealing, murdering, pornography, that, that kind of stuff, right? But there's other sins uh, in the Bible, not Old Testament, New Testament stuff, that keeps you from being holy. And, and people are like, man, you got to be careful, Pastor Paul. That's legalism. you got to watch out. That's works. No, I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about works. You're made the righteousness of God in Christ. There's nothing that you can do to make you any more righteous or any less righteous. But based on our understanding now of what the word holy means, you can be more holy or less holy. You can be more separated unto God for a specific, unique purpose, or you can be common. You can be just like the world, right? And so holiness is really set apart. It's different. It's an otherness. So <clears throat> Ephesians 5, we are in the book of Ephesians still, but Ephesians 5, it says that Christ is waiting for or looking for his bride to be spotless and blameless or holy. We're called to be set apart, to be holy, right? So being set apart can look different to each person. Being set apart to some person might be, hey, get off social media. 
being set apart to someone else is like, hey, stop eating those chocolate chip cookies that Zach makes. They're delicious. Sorry, Zach. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll say that, you know, if, if you're given to appetite, then the Lord says put a knife to your throat, <laughs> you know. And so he's saying, hey, that's a separate. You need to be separate. Not for Zach's cookies. Not for Zach's cookies. Buy more of his cookies, guys. <laughs> but see, the thing is, typically, is in these circles, they're not blatant sins. But they're literally things that you haven't been willing to let go of. And if it is a blatant sin, you're not thirsty. And you're not hungry. You can say you are, but you're not. Because what you're saying is what I'm doing and what I'm allowing is more important than having God in my life. I'm telling you guys, he's calling us up higher. And really when he said, when we hear that he's calling us up higher, I used to disconnect from that like nobody's business. I'm like, well, I ain't going nowhere. I like it right where I am, right down here. I'm on this earth, so I want to be in this earth. But here's what he's really saying. When he's saying, come up higher, he's saying, stop thinking down here. He's literally saying, start thinking like I think, like the realm of impossibility. But here's the only way you can do that is by getting closer. Like, like, I can't sit on no girl's lap. <laughs> but it's like getting close to this guy that looks just like me. My brother from another mother. From mother. Another mother. <laughs> see, he just took me right up and started hugging on me. Because, see, that's going higher. It's getting closer to him. And I can smell his lotion. <laughs> see, God wants us so close to him. that we get the very fragrance and we smell just like him. That when we walk into a room, there's a fragrance of peace. There's a fragrance of joy. There's a fragrance of calm of a peace that passes all your understanding that settles the room of chaos and instability. And the only way that can happen is by us choosing to become holy. Now I'm going to give you some scriptures for it. I know I haven't even given you a scripture yet, but I've got some scriptures for you. <clears throat> and I just want to say this. Hey, if you want to go and play with the world, go ahead. Good luck. But I promise you, you're going to come back wanting. You're going to come back having to carry the note, having to pay the ticket, and it's never, ever. Here's the thing about playing around with the world. It'll take you further than you want to go and cost you more than you're willing to pay. I know from experience. And so I implore you. Don't go that way. I'm saying this with all the love in my heart. Because God doesn't want you to go that way. It breaks his heart. <clears throat> but see, I'm going to give you one Old Testament example, and then I'm going to give you some, a bunch of New Testament examples, so all you New Covenant people will be like, well, that's Old Covenant. <laughs> I'm going to help you out. Uh, but let's look at Joshua. So Joshua, you know, Moses has just bounced and uh, Josh was the the new <laughs> Josh was the new leader of the group, and he's like, "Okay, Lord, what are we gonna do here?" And and here's what he says: He goes, "Hey, check this out. Look at this. Joshua three, verse five. God comes to him and and says something to Joshua. And Joshua is like a pastor. He's a leader. He's going to equip the saints or equip the body. And he goes and tells the people, purify." What? Purify who? What about? Yeah, but but you don't know. Like Darnell, man, he did this wrong the other day. And Ava, man, she got on my nerves earlier. 
so and so man they just don't even show up they say they're going to come they don't even come and so we want to go and purify everybody else you know the whole plank in your ah 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 hey man you got a speck in your eye man right Joshua Yeshua hello by the way we got some cool merch coming out you are going to love it uh, side note uh, so Joshua told the people, purify yourselves for the tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. So before they could even see any great wonders, before they could do anything, you had to purify yourself. Now, I come from Word of Faith. I graduated Rhema. Before Rhema, I was in Word of Faith. And after Rhema, Word of Faith, okay? So I'm all about faith, and I'm all about receiving um, I'm not a works kind of guy. I used to be because I was Catholic. But let me tell you something. I had this all wrong. I was like, well, the blood of Jesus purifies me. Well, no, it cleanses me. Purify means separate for a specific purpose. The blood of Jesus cleansed me from my sin. But if I go back into my sin, I'm no longer purified. Okay? Okay? And so we want God to do all these works. God, I just want you to move. And we usually want God to move for someone else. God, move on my wife. Well, no, purify yourself. Then maybe <laughs> you'll see that he's already moving in there, but you've just been too dumb to notice. And vice versa. But he's saying purify yourself and then he can do great works, right? You're like, well, there you go with your Old Testament stuff, Pastor. Yeah, because it's the majority of the Bible. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is Jesus concealed, and then the New is Jesus revealed. But because, you know, we're balanced and we give the full word, I'm going to give you some new stuff. You ready? Check this out. Hebrews 12. Now remember, too, before we get into this, the Lord told me about, I don't know, two months ago, it's time to take the training wheels off. You remember that? And I remember with my two girls and the training wheels that they had on their bikes, it was hilarious. Because they'd get on there like, Dad, I'm riding, I'm riding. I'm like, no, you're on the training wheels and you're, you're riding on this side for a while, then you're riding on this side for a while, but you're making movement. You're growing, you're getting there. And then we would kind of raise the wheels up a little higher and a little higher because then they kind of get their balance some more. And then the, the, the day came, Dad, we need to take the wheels off. I'm like, okay, okay. So we take the wheels off and I get out on that sidewalk and, and I've grabbed the back of the seat. If you're a mom or dad and you've done this before, you know exactly what's going to happen. And like, okay, let's go, let's go. And they're pedaling. I go, keep pedaling, keep pedaling. And I let go, and they look back. Are you holding on? <laughs> like, oh, look ahead, you know. And, and, and so eventually they got comfortable enough to where I no longer had to hold on, and I was just running beside them acting like I was holding on. And I go, you got it, you got it. And they just, whoo, off they went. And I believe that that's what the Lord's telling us. It's time to not rely on our old way of doing things because he's wanting he wants to do mighty works he wants to do wonderful things but he can't because we're still on these training wheels of life we have to purify we have to be holy we have to set ourselves apart now they say that Paul um, was possibly the author of this book and Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. And he says something very specific. Look at this. And the reason why I chose the NIV, I normally make fun of the NIV. Sorry if you have the NIV. But I call it the nearly inspired version because they, they kind of take what they want and leave out what they want. And, you know, but, you know, it, it's good and relatable. But if you really want a Bible that they can speak to you and you're not a King James or New King James kind of person, and that doesn't make sense, read the New Living Translation, NLT. That one, I, that's my go-to. That's my go-to. <clears throat> um, but it says here, check this out. Paul's saying, make every effort to live in peace with everyone 
and to do what? What's it say? Be holy. What? Paul, wait. Paul, your doctrine's off, man. Be holy? What are you talking about? We already are holy. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, you're the righteousness, but you're not holy. Remember, holy set apart. He's like, be in peace with everybody. Choose to be in peace. Don't be critical. Don't be a pot stirrer. Don't be in strife. But here, on top of that, and be holy. And be otherness. Be other than the world. And be separate. Be unique for a set purpose. And then he goes on, without holiness, no one except Darnell will see the Lord. Don't say that, does it? Or a vet. No. It says no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, without setting yourself apart, you're not going to see the Lord. Now, it's not a salvation type of a thing. It's He's talking about no one will see the goodness or the fullness of, that he has for you unless you set yourself apart. Now, who in here is born again? Show of hands. Come on, be bold. Be bold. Pretty much everybody in here, so we don't have to have an altar call at the end. That's good. Not necessarily. We need to bring some <laughs> unsaved people in here. Uh, but here's the thing, guys. We're born again, so we're going to make it into heaven. We're, we're now going to be in the kingdom but until we transform our mind or until we set our lives apart, we're not going to walk in the fullness and the wholeness that he has. Like we, we, we want to treat God like a, a CBS or Walgreens drive through Oh, I need to get my prescription of healing. Okay, Lord. <sighs> it's going to be 15 minutes. Are you kidding me? Oh, my gosh. No, he's saying set yourself apart. You want you don't even need healing if you're walking in the fullness because you're walking in healing. Right? Now, is it a process? Absolutely. I was praying out something yesterday and I kept getting process, process. It's a process. Like I'm still going through a process of things that he's healing in me. Physical things. And, and, and nothing negative, but I, I just know that it's a process. And so the Lord's saying that there's a process to this, but here's the thing is you need to be holy, and without holiness, you're not going to see him. So he's already made us holy. Then why is he telling us to live holy? Great question. Turn to 1 Peter. Here it is. <clears throat> so 1 Peter, I'm going to read it from here, and she'll, she'll guide you guys along. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. It says, but as he who called you. He called you, guys. He called you. And he's holy, right? We get that. That's the easy part. It says, it says but he who called you is holy. You also be holy. And mine says, in all your conduct. And the word your is italicized. So he's inferring it's up to you in your conduct to be holy. Remember, it's set apart, unique. And he goes, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. We get to choose to be set apart. And it's not some boring thing. Well, now my life's going to be boring as anything. Man, get ready for a wild ride. It's going to be awesome. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians says this. Check this out. 7, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, come on, somebody. <laughs> We've got some promises. And he doesn't say, hey, beloved, these promises, old members. No, beloved, you are loved of him. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse each other. Thank you paying attention <laughs> I'm just kidding you can speak up let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirits the enemy he doesn't want to just let go there's some areas that you got to cleanse yourself of 
And then it says perfecting holiness, perfecting a separateness in the honor or admonition of the Lord. The reverence of the Lord. Not fear isn't something like fear like Job kind of fear. It's more of an honor and a reverence. And so Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, and the church of Corinth was like Las Vegas times 10. It was bad. It was bad. There were uh, statues on the way into Corinth. I did this study for about four months on Corinth, and it was very bad. Like pornographic statues on the way into Corinth. It was jacked up. Uh, and they had temples, which were basically prostitution rings, where anything went. But he's writing to them, hey, you're my beloved, and I know everything around you is crazy, but hey, get all the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit out and make yourself, perfecting yourself in holiness. Set yourself apart. Don't look at those statues, right? We have a thing in my house, so even if it's a commercial, and we can hear like, we hear something like that, my, my wife's like, don't look, don't look. And I'm immediately like this. I turn the opposite direction. Like it's just in me. It's been that way for a long time now. And before it's like, come on, really? Are you serious? It's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. Because you can't unsee those things. There's spiritual hooks in those things that are meant to try to keep you down. But God said, I want you to be holy. I want you to be set apart for my purpose because my purpose is going to be way better than your best purpose you could ever come up with. And so Paul's saying to this church of Corinth, he's saying, get so bent on Jesus that you don't even think straight. Because straight thinking is wrong. Like he's saying, hey, yeah, yeah, make your plan, but get so bent on Jesus that that's the main focus that you have in your life. He's like, get thirsty, not the worldly kind of thirsty, because my daughter told me, don't say that, Dad. Thirsty's not good. I'm not talking about worldly thirsty. I'm talking about the Bible kind of thirsty. The Bible kind of thirsty is this. I earnestly desire you, God. Psalm says it like this. As a deer panteth for the waters, so my soul, mind, will, and emotions longs after thee. And so literally what that means is like if you ever go look at a, a deer that's thirsty, it'll roll right up to that creek and start drinking away, not caring if you're there or not. That's what he's saying. You need to get so consumed with God, so consumed, so in love with Jesus, that that's the only thing that you want. Eagerly longing for it. But see, here's the thing, is that if we're honest with each other and ourselves, we allow our desire to peek at other things. Like, yeah, I'll read the Bible uh, after I finish watching this episode. And that's okay to watch the episodes, but if that's earnestly your desire more than spending time with the Lord is, then that's a problem. And I'm not saying this to condemn or anything like that. I'm saying this out of love, right? And so listen to what, what this word uh, thirst is in the Greek. It's dipseo, and it means this. Those who are said to thirst who painfully feel their want of and eagerly long for those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. So it's not just a thirst without something in return. It's a thirst that truly refreshes, supports, and strengthens your soul. And so the thing with the deep thirst comes is you've got to have him. But if you got a mediocre thirst, guess what you're going to get? Mediocre outpouring. If you got a so-so thirst, you're going to have a so-so outpouring. Remember, God says it depends on you. It depends on you, and the, and the output that you want is dependent upon you. So we want to be so thirsty that there's nothing else that matters because there's rooms of God, guys. There are rooms of God that he wants for you so badly. I was sharing with the worship team this morning that my daughter Ava lives in our foyer. Actually, she doesn't, but I thought that would get your attention. Our foyer is about, what is it, seven, eight feet wide, something like that. It's not very wide. It's, it's decent, but it's got a real tall ceiling. It's kind of cool. 
and it's about maybe 10, 11 feet deep. And in that foyer, there's a, a, a like a little barn door over here. There's opening to the left and opening to the right. That's my office. And you can see into the, the uh, living room where the fireplace is. You kind of look over and see that there's a nook and, and a, a kitchen. But Ava, she just rolled up in the foyer. Her and Gracie, chilling. They got their cots and made bunk beds in the, in the foyer. They got some of those post-it stickers where they could hang all their clothes on the wall. They got a half bathroom right there. They can hear the TV in the other room. And their dad is in his office doing his thing. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? Like, what is wrong with your kids? They're not that way. They got their own rooms. See, the thing is, is there's rooms of God, but we're living in the foyer. We're like, oh, God, I love you. Thank you so much. Oh, worship you. Worship you. And we cry, but we're living in the foyer. He's like, come into the living room. <laughs> come live with me. Let me show you some things. Let me, let me get all that dross off of you. Let me get all these things. Let me talk to you. Let me speak to your heart. And all these things start peeling off of you. You're like, well, I really don't have any sin in my life, Pastor Paul. That's good. But let me tell you, uh, if it's blatant sin, get it off. But let me tell you what another sin is according to God. Unbelief. Unbelief. Like, you don't really have faith for anything. Like, man, we're making it. I'm working two jobs. It's pretty good. Saving that money. That's great, but where's your faith? What are you believing God for? Where do, do you want to impact the nation? What's going to be your mark when you go stand before him in the throne? Well, you know, God, I saved $700,000. He's like, really? Show me where it is. Oh, wait, I couldn't bring it with me. I, that used to be me. I'm going to make $17 bazillion. But I'm sorry, I saw long ago, that's not going to fulfill me. Here's what's going to fulfill me, doing what God's called me to do. When I stand before him, I want him to say, well, you're done. No, I want him to say, well done, <laughs> good and faithful servant. We're not going to say, well, you're done, you made it. Whoosh. Wasn't sure about you. No, no, <laughs> He's going to say, well done. Why? Because here's why. I'm, get, I'm getting there. I promise I'm getting there. The more time that we spend with him, the more time that we thirst and long for him, the more that it's just on us. The people go, man, there's something about you. I just like you. And let me tell you also, conversely, sometimes when people just don't like you, you know who I'm talking about. You got people at your work or people that just, they're manipulative they're bossy. Uh, they just look at you and they snarl. Or they try to get one over on you or one up on you, something like that. You know what it is? They're jealous. Something on them is jealous of the God in you. See, I believe that God's called us to be a people that we carry his presence everywhere we go. And people can't help but be drawn to the love of God in us. When they see us, they go, man, there's something different about you. And don't get offended if they say it's not your looks. <laughs> it's the God in you. See, what I found in the Word about God, whew, is that he won't waste his presence on you. But we've bought a lie that he will. And, and I'm, not, I'm not throwing any shade on my family or my, my wife or my kids at all. Um, I'm, a, I'm a punctual person. But I, I fall late all the time when it comes to the gym. Ask Stephen. He'll tell you. I'll be like, hey, I'm running 17 minutes behind. Or No, that's Jeff Hager. Jeff will do that. <laughs> but I, I, I'll show up a few minutes late, and that's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But there's times in my life that I'll put things off. Haven't we done that? Like, I'll get to it in just a second. 
my wife will ask me to do something. Okay, yeah, I'll do it. And then it's nighttime, and she's like, I here's what I hear, and I hate hearing this. Paul Cooper. I feel like a kid all over again. I'm like, no, I guess I'm not 53. I'm like 13 again. Oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> what did I do? What did I forget? Right? <laughs> you know you've done it. You know you've done it. <laughs> and, and here's what I found out about God. See, we think that God will just wait on us. It's like, oh, are you ready? Mm -hmm. And he will. He loves you that much that his mercies are new every morning. His, his grace is there for you. But when he's walking by, if you're not attentive and if you're not willing to, to separate yourself, then he'll pass you right by. It says in Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, roam to and fro throughout the whole earth on someone whose heart is faithful towards him. Look at the road to Emmaus. Jesus was resurrected. He's walking with two disciples. They're talking, and he's going to keep on going. He's going to keep walking. But what does the word say? It says, they, but they constrained him. But they said, no, Jesus, no, please, please stay with us. Stay with us. There's, there's something about you. We just want you in our life. Don't leave yet. And I believe that he's put a hunger in each and every one of us that if we'll actually remove those things, we'll start seeing that hunger and we'll have this heart cry of Jesus, don't leave. He's never going to leave you or forsake you, but his presence can be manifest. We know that he's omnipresent, but he will not manifest where he's not honored. Think about it, guys. We're, we're, we're here, and, and we're in worship, and, and Darnell's standing next to me, hands raised, whoop, whoop. My hands are raised, and, and let's just say that I'm the guy that my hands raised, but I feel absolutely nothing. Darnell's over here. Just tears streaming down his face. You're like, man, we, he must have some serious problems. That's what we think. Oh, isn't that sweet? God's just really touching his heart. He must really be having some hard times. No. No. He made room for God, <laughs> and God showed up and started blessing him so much that you can't help but cry tears of joy. And why is it that one person can, and I don't mean to y'all, i got to calm down. Y'all calm down. Uh, one person can receive all this blessing, and the person standing right next to them gets nothing. Well, because they're not honoring him. He's walking right by. They're bored. It's not the song that they like. When are you going to play Maverick City? Then, if they play, oh, if they could have just played that bridge from that one song, man, it would have dropped. No, it was waiting already to drop, but you weren't ready. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, please hear me. I am not saying anything negative. I'm just telling you the heart cry of God. He is longing for you to spend time with him. Um, Matthew 5. <clears throat> I am not apologizing. <clears throat> yeah. So Matthew 5, this is so cool. I love this because it's the Beatitudes. And it's these eight things, these eight blessings. But what I do hate is I hate how um, the world or some religious churches depict it. Okay. Um, now we we see the word blessed. We're like, yeah, awesome. But we hear the word blessed. Oh, I'm so blessed. You know, you, you see Cardi B. I'm blessed. Uh, no, you're not, girl. You are not blessed. You're crazy. You twist it up. Blessed means empowered to prosper. Now it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But here's the thing, guys. We see the word poor, like, oh, i got to be poor. That's some old Catholic religion junk. I came out of that. It was stupid. 
Now, I want to read this from the Amplified for you guys because there's something that connects to this. It has everything to do with being hungry. It has everything to do with abiding in Him. Uh, and if you're taking notes today, the, the title of my message is Keep It Salty. And you'll be like, what? But you're going to get it. I want you to hear this out of the Amplified. <clears throat> Blessed. Now listen to this Amplified Classic. Happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward condition. I mean, I feel God on that. Listen to the, what the word blessed means according to the word. Blessed is happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of your outward condition are the poor in spirit. Now, here it is. Here's what this means. The humble. The humble who rate themselves insignificant. See, because you're like, you know, hey, I called you. You didn't call me back. Well, did you leave me a message? Well, couldn't you see that I called you? Well, you didn't leave me a message. So in my old school mentality, it wasn't important. Did you text me? Well, I called you. And we treat God that way. Hey, God, I said your name. I asked you to help me. Yeah, but you kept moving. You kept doing your thing. He said, hey, you're going to be blessed if you humble yourself. You don't think of yourself higher than you ought to. That was my biggest problem. I was like, Lord, I did this, and I sold that, and I gave this, and I got that. Where is it, God? My wife tells the story all the time. I, like, I scared the mess out of her. She's like, who did I marry? And this is like three years in. She's like, what is wrong with him? I married a crazy man. Well, she did, but now I'm crazy for Jesus, you know. <laughs> but I literally was, I was so haughty. Hey, the word says that if I do this, and I'm quoting the word back to God. Like he's got it wrong. Don't act like you've never done that. It's okay. I'm just telling off on me. Man, my pastor was jacked up. But thank God I'm not. See, I'm helping you so you don't get do like what I did. But check this out. It says, blessed and envily happy with the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation of his matchless grace are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, for sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the Amplified, but I highly recommend you read the Amplified today of this, you can put it back up there, please, uh, of this uh, account. Next verse. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. Next. Blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. So meek means humble. Did you know meekness and humility are brothers or sisters, however you want to look at it? They go hand in hand. One does not exist without the other. So what happens when people, they start off meek, they start off humble, but then they allow familiarity in. And when familiarity comes in, then the power leaves, because honor leaves. Because when there's no honor, there's no blessing. That was a side note. But the meek, the humble, will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Dang, that's good. Because why? You're going to get filled. Who's hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Heck yeah, we got it. It's already ours. We're the righteous of God in Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, not pacemakers, for they shall see. They will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revel and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. What? That's counter to the culture we live in. But it says, great is your reward in heaven. For they persecute, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are what? The salt of the earth. Keep it salty. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, flavor, flavor is the one. Pub, no, sorry, sorry. How shall it be seasoned? Flavor, flavor is not the sun, and public enemy is not the one. Can't trust it. <laughs> so, so you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing and be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Uh, another translation says it's not even good enough for the dung hill. It's not even good for the poop hill, guys. But it's thrown and trampled underneath. How many like salt? Heck yeah. It flavors everything. I used to be my wife when she married me. She's like, I don't know what was wrong with you because... I was like Mr. Bodybuilder guy, and so she comes over to my apartment for the first time, and it's super neat and clean and all this stuff. Uh, and she goes and opens my fridge, and there's a couple of dozen eggs, a couple of cans of tuna, and that's it. <laughs> Some powdered potatoes <laughs> mixed, just add water, a little bit of salt, no pepper, a little bit of seasoning and some frozen chicken in the freezer. She's like, you need some help. And so it took her 26 years to get me to, to have some flavor in my life. But the cool thing, I didn't even like salt that much back in the day. She's like, this needs some salt. Nanny, she'll salt it before she even tastes it. But you got to. That's because salt is important. Salt flavors everything. Who salts their food before they eat it? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I see a lot of people. A lot of people. Because you don't trust them. You go to neighborhood jam, they come up with some eggs and some hash browns and some bacon. What do you do? Where's the salt? Cha, 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 cha. You don't know if they dump that thing over in there. You don't know. But see, salt has a flavor. <laughs> they did not. She said they did not. But salt has something that makes you thirsty, guys. Anybody ever had french fries without salt? Tastes like disappointment. It's terrible. I'm going to have some potato sticks. <laughs> Leave a film in my mouth. Gross. Right? When we, if you go eat some Mexican today, get ready. Don't come eat with me because I will baptize those chips in salt. And I don't, I don't even taste the chips first. I'm like, it needs salt. It needs salt. They train, my wife trained me right. She trained me right. <laughs> so the thing is about salt, here's what I, I started looking up. You know, I'm reading this about salt. It jumps out at me. And so I wanted to find out about salt. Do you want to know about some salt? Let's, let me give you some facts on salt. This is so cool. Salt cleans and cures. Since ancient times, salt has been used to fight infection. Many historical records going all the way back to Hippocrates show that salt was used to clean and treat wounds. The, Greek, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Egyptians all used salt as a disinfectant to treat cuts. See, we look at it on TV now like it's torture. You know, you cut them on the back and you put salt in the wound. Oh, you rub salt in my wound. Yeah, it hurts, but you're actually helping the person. If you want to do anything, you need to put some dirt on that thing. Like, if they really knew what they were doing, like, hey, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for healing my wound for me. Let's check this out. It was a disinfectant to treat cuts, wounds, mouth sores, and skin irritation is still used today. That's why when you get a sore throat nowadays, what does your mama say? What do you call her? Gargle with some salt water. 
I'm like, man, my throat hurts, babe. Where's some halls? I need some cough drops. She goes, no, you need to gargle with some salt water. I'm like, that's disgusting. But it works. Here's why. Salt draws water out of the tissues in a process called osmosis. It causes a drying effect. When the salt concentration is high enough, salt kills bacteria through effectively sucking the water out of the cell. And salt's anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties reduce congestion, neti pot, <laughs> sanitize, and open the airways. You're salty. And so here's why I'm telling you all this, is that when you are the salt of the earth, when you're staying separated unto God, then you're immune to the bacterias of the world, to those things that the world would say, oh, you just need to worry about this, and oh, you got to, wow, you can't, you got to carry some cares. No, 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 I'm salty. In fact, I'm so salty, I bring flavor to the world. Right? You need a little salt in your life, so just bring me around. Now, and it's not salty like, oh, man, they salty. Salty in the Urban Dictionary or today's language would be bitter, mean, angry. I'm not talking about that kind of salty. I'm talking about godly salty, right? And, and so in the Beatitudes, he's going through all these things about blessing, 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 and then he immediately connects it to salt. And he, and he says this. He goes, look, when you get familiar with God and treat him as common, you lose your saltiness. When you don't stay holy, don't stay separated unto him, you lose your effectiveness. And you're not gonna you're gonna get cast out from walking into the fullness that he has for you. Right? Now Luke is another example of it. <clears throat> and he says, This is Jesus, so we know. You know, everybody's like, oh, you need to get some of that low-sodium soy sauce. And, uh, da, 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 da. and uh, Well, Jesus said salt's good. Here's the scripture for you. Ready? Luke 14, verse 34. Jesus says, salt is good. So if somebody tells you you don't need salt, say, well, you need to get behind me, Satan, because Jesus said it was good. It says, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how's it going to be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land or the dung hill, but men will throw it out. And he goes on to say, because remember these past couple weeks, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's like, I'm, I'm dropping some truth bombs, but you've got to be willing to hear it. And did you know, here's another fact about salt I really like. Did you know that salt never, never loses its flavor on its own? Now, a lot of people are like, well, I would argue with that, Pastor Paul. Well, let me tell you why salt loses its flavor. You know, because it says here that it loses its flavor. But on its own, it doesn't. It has to, listen to this, the only way salt can lose its flavor is if an outside source or chemical impurity is mixed with it. Sin. That's the only way it can lose its flavor. When it loses its flavor... It loses its value. So we got to keep it salty. Say it with me. Keep it salty. Now, now check this out. How do we keep it salty? Great question. Glad you asked. The Bible says that we are to be transformed, not conformed to the world. Now, check this out. I'm glad that we have this little bottle here. See the shape of this bottle? Now, the water is not this shape. It's the bottle. But what I pour into the bottle conforms to the shape of the bottle. So, oh, 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 oh. but if I bend it, the confirmation of the, yeah, we're going to have a water party. Whoa, sprinkler. Um. This bottle is what causes what's inside it to conform. And so Paul says in Romans, he goes, don't be conformed, don't be formed to the fashions or the ways of the world, 
but be transformed, metamorphosis, remember, caterpillar to butterfly, um, can be transformed in the renewing of your mind with the Word of God. So it's the Word that causes the transformation, and then now we're formed up with what God says about us. Right? <clears throat> and here's how we keep it salty. <clears throat> We must abide. What does abide mean? It means spending time with God. And a lot of times we think abide means prayer. And it kind of does. But it also means being quiet. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. For me especially, like I feel like I need to be praying and saying something all the time versus just sitting there. This was, you know, years back. But I've learned to abide really well. Um, it, it's 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 something that the Lord has started to cultivate in me, and it's really it comes from you know knowing Him. John fifteen says it like this. <clears throat> you pull that up for me. John fifteen says this. This is Jesus talking. He goes, "I'm the true vine, and my Father's the vine dresser." No, look, He says, "I'm the true vine." That means there's some false vines out there, right? But he's the true vine, and so if he's the true vine, then, then we don't look at the false vines, and his father's the vine dresser. And he goes on to say this, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Now, we used to twist that up into a works mentality. That's not what it's saying. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes away that it may bear more fruit. So if you feel like things are being pruned in your life, guess what? It's about to be a fruitful season. Amen? It's about to be a fruitful season in your life. It says, you're already clean. What? Are you kidding me? We've been talking about holiness and being set apart. He's saying you're clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. You've chosen to accept this word as final authority in your life, and now you're clean. That's holy. Here's how we stay salty, guys. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. He says it again. I am the vine. You're the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So check this out. You know, he was talking about cannot did you know the word cannot in the Greek? It doesn't mean cannot. It literally means this. It means possible with not attached to it. It means it's not even possible to bear fruit outside of abiding in him. And, and so I need, I need some help. If, if maybe Glenn and Darnell or Jeremy and somebody can each grab one chair and put it up here. I want to show you this one thing, and we're going to close. I know I'm taking a little bit of your time. But it, it bears uh, just any chair. It's okay. Yep, perfect. Yep, one and one. I need two total. Well, we've got, we got some great helpers. Yeah, just put it right over here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot last minute there. Yeah, just put it right here, and I'll get it from you in a minute. Thank you. Here's the thing, guys. <clears throat> we get into the Word... And we get, we know what it says about abiding. And we're like, yes, I'm the righteousness of a crowd in Christ. We're in the book of Ephesians. I'm seated in heavenly places. And when, so we have this seat of authority, right? It's a positional seat. Aren't we seated? Is it true? We are seated in heavenly places, are we not? Far above. All principalities, powers, rules, artists, weakness, high places, everything's at right. We're far above it. And so we'll, it's very easy for us to sit in this seat, this one of position. Yes. And what does a king do from this seat? Declares and decrees. That's awesome, right? But remember what I said at the very beginning about how we negate other truths? And they can't really work together. They can work. It'll work, but not in the fullness it's like having your phone on low power mode. 
If you know about low power mode and you have an iPhone, and all you Samsung people, I can't speak to that because I don't know what low power mode's like for you guys. You probably don't have low power mode. I don't know. Because it's such a good battery. It's so much better. Maybe. I don't know. But on low power mode, it doesn't open certain applications, and it only operates at a certain capacity. And really what it's supposed to be is there's this positional seat of who you are in Christ, what's available to you, but then there's a relational seat. And the relational seat is abiding in him, sitting, waiting on him. Knowing him. Paul says, hey, I count all this stuff as dust, but that I may know him, become more intimately acquainted with him. That was his purpose in life. He goes, hey, all this stuff, that's great, but what I want to know is I want to know him more. Relational. For all you married people, if you've been married for over two years, you have an idea of what spending time with your spouse is like. And if it's only transactional and it's only just to pay the bills and provide, you don't have much of a marriage. But see, here's the thing, guys. <clears throat> it was never meant to be two seats. It's meant to be one. I can sit in a seat of position because of my relationship. I have a positional seat because of a relational seat in him. Because I abide in him. Because I'm setting time aside to spend with him. Because he's my everything and I can't move. I can't live. I can't breathe without him. And it's, it's not dangerous, but it is... I, I say you better be serious when you talk to God about wanting to know him more. Because if you know me, my um, release or my checkout for me is watch a good action movie. You know, I can get lost in a whole day. I, if you put me in a theater, and I've done this before, before I was really, you know, pa before I pastored, I would stay in one movie theater for like two to three, like, movies. Pay for one, watch three. Not good. I've asked for forgiveness. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed watching the movie so much that that's what I did. wasn't good. But see, uh, over the years, it's not that way anymore. But then I started talking. And I was like, God, I just want to know you more. And so, like, on my Monday, my day off, that's my day of relaxing. I'll try to watch a movie. It doesn't satisfy me anymore. I'm miserable. <laughs> it's, it's not you know, like I'm mad at everybody miserable. But I'm like, I need to get into some word. I need to just spend some time with him. And then when I spend time with him, I, I become nicer. <laughs> See, if you abide in him, you'll bear much fruit. And, and the word um, abide, it literally means to stay in a prolonged time or to an ongoing posture of remaining. That's hard for a lot of guys. Hard for girls too, probably. But if you're the kind of guy that you always got to be doing something and go, 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 and like, oh, I praise you, Lord. I thank you. You're amazing and you're awesome. Well, that's hard for you to learn to abide because sometimes you just got to sit. Sometimes you got to rest. You know, and I was looking up vines, and I know we're, we've gone over some time, so I'm going to close up. Worship team, go ahead and come up here. Um, <clears throat> we, we've had some... Um, relational <laughs> things in our lives that <clears throat> excuse me have been a challenge and it's hard for us to know how to abide like if you just sit there in the silence sometimes you get bored anybody besides me been bored before yeah just sitting around I'm bored and like Pastor, this is boring right now. Are you going to get on with this? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But the, it's this ongoing place of abiding or resting or remaining in him. And as I was doing this yesterday during men's prayer, 
I kept getting this perfect peace. And there was such a peace by the end of the thing. I was getting it over here, and at the end of it, Darnell goes, man, I got such a peace here. Like, I could stay like this forever, but then I'm super jacked up excited. Like, I want to go do a bunch of stuff. And so the, the scripture kept coming up, perfect peace whose mind is set on you. Abiding, you have to fix your focus. You have to set your mind on him. And, and the thing about set, what it's telling you is something was broken. There was something that 